Art. Right, so uh, thanks for coming to this uh, last section of the day. My name is Chi Ke Che. I'm from E3 at Taiwan. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, this is a new service, what we call physical machine leasing service. Now, physical machine leasing service is also known as HAS. I think some of the talks also use this uh, same term, HAS, to talk about you know, a, a service that allows a tenant to rent a, what we call a physical data center instance. That allows a user to get a, a set of servers and then a set of storage volumes attached to the server. And then you have a physical network that connect their physical servers. So why do people want HAS? Because they probably have their preferred hypervisor. So they don't want to use hypervisors that Amazon or Microsoft provide. Or they just want to do container-based virtualization. They don't really need a hypervisor-based virtualization. Or they just want to use the bare metal to do big data analytics, DNN training, or high-performance computing. All the kind of server they are using are just not suitable for hyper virtualization, like microserver or ARM-based servers. So traditionally, we have ICE uh, service, right? In, in the basic unit of rental is to rent a virtual machine. Now, it is the service provider, ICE service provider, that owns the hardware and manages the hardware. Then we have a co-location. Like the service provider basically provides space, electricity, and network connectivity. So the basic unit of rental is a rec space. Now, in this case, it's a user that owns and manages the hardware. What HAS is about is that the basic unit is a physical machine. You, you get to rent a physical machine. Now, it's a service provider that owns the hardware, but it's the user that, that rents the hardware and manages that. Right? That's the difference. So the, the, the service model of HAS allows a, a, a user to submit a reservation request. And that reservation request will consist of a, se a set of servers. Now, each server can have its own unique hardware specification, CPU memory, and BIOS, BMC, PCI device, and OS configuration. And then you also have a set of storage volumes attached to the servers. And you can specify a set of IP subnet to connect all these physical servers and maybe a set of public IP addresses assigned to some of the servers, and as well as their corresponding uh, firewall policies. The key thing here is that when I'm a user and when I'm getting a hard service, I'm remote from that p physical data center that actually houses the physical server. So as a user, I need to be able to remotely sort of m to acquire this server and monitor and then install operating system and application on these servers. So this is a key requirement of uh, HAS. Now, in this world, we have the guy who's actually providing the HAS service called HAS provider, and the guy who actually uses the HAS service called HAS tenant. Right? So in, in terms of the technology to build such a HAS service, you need something at the deployment time and something at the wrong time. So at the deployment time, when a user uh, acquires a, a, a physical data center instance, PDCI, then you need tool to do server provisioning, to do provisioning for storage, and then to provision for network. And in, in particular, with respect to the network, like imagine that you have a bunch of servers, and then you want to carve out some part of it to one tenant, another part of it to, to another tenant. So you need some technology to isolate this tenant from each other. And remember, in this case, the servers are, owned, are supposed to be owned by the tenants. You're not supposed to put any lines of code on the server. So it has to be done in an agentless fashion. You cannot install any agent on this server, and then yet you can still provide a proper isolation among them. And then you have a runtime uh, component. Once I get a PD, when a tenant gets a PDCI and the other tenant gets a PDCI, then I should be able to monitor this uh, PDCI the way I want it. And also, we need uh, something called IT hardware lifecycle management for this uh, HAS provider. Then I, I need to sort of prepare this server and lease them out. And when they return, I had to clean them and so on. That's what we call uh, IT hardware lifecycle management. Now, the, the server provisioning component of this HAS solution that we are developing is called BAMPI, so the bare metal provisioning from E3. That's where I come from. So what it does is it addresses this pain point of setting up the hardware and firmware and the first operating system on bare metal uh, OS. There will, we, in this particular conference, we have multiple talks that talk about similar issues, except that we think that our tool is probably maybe among the best in all these bare metal provisioning tools. The reason is very simple. What we, the, the assumption that we make is the least. So what we are assuming is the following, that we have a set of servers. Each server has a, a NIC, and each, NIC, each server can have multiple NIC, and each NIC has its own MAC address, okay? And they are somehow connected in some way physically by the on-site engineer. That's the given situation. And we are going to automate the rest. And so what, we, what can we do? 
we can extract the physical connectivity between servers and switches automatically, right? So I get to know which NIC car or which server is connected to which port of which switch. So that's what we mean by the physical connectivity between servers and switches. And I can configure IP addresses for a particular NIC car according to certain policy. So for example, I have a particular NIC car connected to slot number 14 of switch number two. And I want to say I want to assign an IP address to this NIC car as something like x.x.2.14. So in other words, I want to assign my IP address according to some physical connectivity pattern. I can do that. And then we can do things like BMC, BIOS configuration, their firmware upgrade, NIC car, RAID car uh, configuration, and their firmware upgrade. We can install the first operating system and then configure the uh, operating system and then check the configuration are correct, for example. And this we can do. And we also provide extensive audit logging and robust error handling. So that when you are stuck in somewhere, like when you get, get want to configure some BMC and doesn't respond to you, you know what's going on and you can take proper actions against it. Because most of these steps are automated, so we get the benefits of reduced error, lower setup cost, and speedier deployment. And this tool has been deployed in KDDI for over two years, using you know, setting up real servers, uh, thousands of such servers. And then from a user's point of view, what do you get? You reuse a BMP tool, and then you have a set of server over there, and you have some BIOS or BMC configuration, some operating system configuration, some firmware that you need to set up, this and that. And then some OS image for those first operating system you want to install on these servers. And once you have all this in ready, then you just you know, invoke the BMP tool and then start doing it. More specifically, what you do is like this. First, you create a server group. Now you can say, okay, I want to operate on these uh, thousand, ser these hundred servers. And so you pick them up. Oh, I, these servers are connected in certain ways. And then I'll give the server set a group name, saying that this is my server group. And then, I'll, then, then I create a server group. At the same time, I can define a provisioning task. A provisioning task is a, a set of provisioning operations that you want to operate on each of the server in the server group. Right, so you can, you can create a, a, a provisioning task, give it a name, and then, okay, and then define the action that you want to do in the task. Thank you. So, so, so each action in the provisioning task could mean what I just said, configure certain BMC option, bias option, upgrade the firmware, blah, blah, blah. You can define a task that you want to do. And then once you do that, then once you select a server group, define the provision task, and then you can start it. And once you start it, you can monitor it. That's a good part about BMP. You don't just do it and then get in the, in the dark. You don't know what's happening. Maybe something happened, maybe something don't happen. But this gives you the progress and progression monitoring. You know exactly which operation of which pro provision task on which server, and their, their status and their progress. And then for each of the provisioning operations, you get to know the result and its status, and you can zoom in and see what's happening there. All right. So that's very handy. So the unique features of this BMP tool is the following. The first of all, what I just say, you can assign IP addresses to NIC car according to some physical connectivity. That comes in too handy when you really want to sort of like locate a specific servers or specific NIC car. And you also can run on these servers that are located in multiple uh, level three subnets. So that means that we use this DHCP relay technology that allows you to, to go to do this pixie boot across routers. And then we also leverage IP multicast technology to reduce the amount of time required to boot this disposable and first OS. And, and finally, we have transactional support. This is very important for remote operation. So imagine you are a user of Haas, and then you are, you, are, you are provisioning your servers, and out of the blue, something goes wrong, but you are outside the data center, so you have nowhere to go. So in order to do solve this problem, everything has to be transactional. Either it happens or it doesn't happen. So it will provide that kind of guarantee for you. So this figure shows the, the effectiveness of multicasting. Like I said, that in all the server provisioning tasks, booting the OS is the most time-consuming part. So in this figure, x axis is the number of servers, y axis is the time required to boot the disposable OS and the, and the first OS. The, the, the blue line corresponds to the one that uses IP multicast. So the amount of time required pretty much stays flat, regardless of the number of servers that you want to provision. Now, if you don't use IP multicast, the red one, the, the, the overall time would increase in, in linearly proportional to the number of servers that you want to provision. 
So we also, like I said, we test this. Is, you already use it in, in KDDI for, for multiple years in multiple data centers to set them up. And in one particular instance, we apply this to 80 servers, and it reduced the amount of time to do all these things on the left, not just put in the OS, all these things uh, on the left from 288 main hours to down to 1.5 main hours. So it's a, it's a significant uh, reduction in the amount of time required to do this uh, bare metal provisioning. And then the, the other component in our hard solution is the network part, right? We just talked about the server provision, now we are talking about the network provision. It actually has three unique features. One is this physical network server connectivity discovery. That's the one I'm talking about. Which unique car of which server is connected to which port or which switch? We can know that, all right? The second thing is we do this VLAN-based inter-tenant network isolation, right? In a, in a hard solution, you need uh, some sort of isolation among tenants' uh, PDCI network, and you need to do this in an agentless way. So we choose VLAN. Right? And the third thing is, is some kind of monitoring and, uh, and the problem shooting the technology called tenant aware multi resolution network traffic analysis. So the first thing is this server switch connectivity. So what's the problem? So let's say I'm running a server, and usually this server has multiple interfaces, and each interface is abstracted into an ETH interface. So or, or I already know ETH1, ETH2, ETH3, and somehow I know ETH2 seems to be problematic, and I want to get some on-site engineer to replace that new car. But the problem is I don't know which one is an ETH2. So what I need to know is to say that, okay, I can associate uh, the uh, MAC address associated with the ETH interface. And I can also say that that particular MAC address is connected to which switch port through that physical connectivity discovery. So in the end, I get to know that for a particular ETH interface, it's actually connected to switch number 13, port number 4. And I can go to the on-site engineer to tell me that replace that NIC card that's currently connected to switch number 4. Uh, 14, uh, 14 and port number four, uh, that one. So that's the, 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 the thing that we can do with this technology. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to manage the physical connectivity of a, of a house service. And the second component of this uh, Peregrine technology is it does this VLAN-based load balancing. So what's the idea? So imagine that you are running a house and you have like 500 servers connected in some way in the network. And then you use VLAN to isolate them. So pretty soon that you probably have like 10 tenants and each tenant is using like five uh, VLANs. So right there, there are 50 VLANs uh, running on top of this physical network. What VLAN-based load balancing is to say that we are quite trying to spread out the, these 50 VLANs on the physical network in such a way that the, the traffic loads on the physical networks are balanced. So that's the idea. So how do we do that? So just to give you a general idea. So we can say, okay, the first, Tenant comes along, he uses the red part of the physical network. And the second tenant comes along, I try to spread out. So we have the green parts. And then the third one further, I spread them further out. And the fourth one is the purple part and so on. So that's the idea that when I'm placing these VLANs on the physical network, I try to spread them out so that you can make more effective use of the physical resources of the network. And then with this, we can actually show that uh, through simulation in a larger network using uh, leaf and spine architecture, that we can achieve a factor of two to five overall capacity improvement if you use this VLAN-based load balancing as opposed to if you just use a single spanning tree architecture. And then the third component of Peregrine is this idea of tenant-aware network traffic analysis. The use case is the following. So say I'm running a house, and I have 10 tenants running on my system already, right? And then one of the tenants calls in and say, how come my network is really slow? And somehow my network is slow. Can you tell me what happens? So a HAAS operator is supposed to uh, find out the root cause and fix the problem and report back. Hopefully within a couple of minutes, like five minutes, you should report back what's happening there. So this tool is meant to solve this problem. So how do we do that? So before we do that, what we need to do is to figure out the physical portion of the network that are used by a tenant. But 
Currently, most existing data centers use MLEG architecture. And MLEG, as you know, they use hashing algorithm to determine the physical sort of undelayed path used by specific network connection. So as a result, most network administrators actually don't know, you know what, which network connections are actually going through which network, physical network link. And we are able to solve this problem by you know, doing this uh, intelligent discovery of you know, how this hashing algorithm works and so on. So this figure is just showing that in a particular instance that we try, between a pair of servers, there are two network connections. On the left is using port 60,000, and on the right is using port 60,001. The same pair of host servers and two connections going between these two, two pair, this pair of servers. And one has a performance about uh, 930 megabit, the other has about 550 megabit. And the reason is because these two connections going through two different physical paths, and we are able to identify them. And one of them going through bottleneck link, and the other guy doesn't go through the bottleneck link. That's why the left-hand side guy is running just fine, and the right-hand side guy actually running into a bottleneck, and that's why it's slow, even though these two connections are running between the same pair of servers. Right? Now, with that, now we can start to draw. Then I can ask the question, what is my first tenant? Which portion of the physical network my first tenant is using. So I can say, okay, this is the first tenant. Tenant A is using this portion of my physical network. Tenant B is using this portion. Tenant C is using this portion. Tenant D is using this portion, and so on. Right there, that's already pretty good, right? Imagine I have a house, and I have 50, 100, thousands of tenants. I just want to know, tenant three, three, 329, which portion of physical network that guy is currently using? Right there, I can already tell you that. Right? But that's just a visibility. I give you more visibility. But then when some problem raises, like that, some particular link becomes red. That means the traffic on that link already exceeds a certain threshold. I want to know who is the culprit, who should be responsible for that increase of that uh, traffic load on that particular link. So we can zoom in. We can do this multi-resolution zoom in. So we can ask, like this link has both direction, like this direction and that direction. Which direction is problematic? Turns out that that particular direction, one direction is 800 megabit, the other direction is 500 megabit. So we know, okay, the 800 megabit one is the problem. So we can zoom in. On that direction of that link, which tenants are using that direction of that link? And we can say there are three tenants, A, B, C. And then tenant A is using 400 megabit, tenant B is using 200, tenant C is using 100. So we can say, hmm, tenant A seems to be the culprit. It's the guy who is responsible. Let's zoom in. Which VLAN? Tenant A may use multiple VLAN, right? So it turns out that tenant A has three VLAN, 1301, 1305, 1358. They have three VLANs that tenant A is using. And we can isolate that a particular VLAN, 1301, contribute about 360 megabit per second to the total traffic load. So that's the one that seems to be more interesting. Let's zoom in. Within that VN, I want to know which server pair is responsible for that particular VLAN's traffic load. Turns out there are three server pairs in that VLAN that are currently communicating. And one of the server pairs between 10.5 and 10.3 is accounting for about two, 250 megabit per second. So that, that's the guy that seems to be interesting. And what do we do? We want to know between that server pair which network connections are actually flowing. So I can tell you there are three network connections between that server pair. And I also can tell you which network connect connection is the problem. The one between 12.350A and 5001, that network connection accounts for about 200 megabit per second. So aha, that's the guy. That's the guy that causes the red link to become, the link to become red, all right? And so, so we get our guy. And now I can redirect the traffic between this network connection to uh, uh, Wireshark or TCP dump to do further analysis. I can do interactive analysis, or I can redirect it to a deep packet analyzer. I can know which application type and which workload is actually running inside that particular network connection. And all this process is what we mean by tenant aware, multi-resolution network traffic analysis. Coming from a particular physical network that become overloaded, I can tell you exactly which network connection is the problem, and I can tell you what's going on inside that particular network connection. Right? And then, other than this tool, server provisioning and network, we always have PTCI monitoring and management. Uh, it's a tenancy aware, it's allow each uh, tenant to monitor its PDCI and the uh, operator to monitor all PDCI. 
And we also have a set of uh, operational support tool just to make this whole thing more, more usable, right? And this is a comparison between uh, our E-Tree Hard solution and uh, OpenStack Ironic and IBM Soft Layer. So on the, on the left, a lot of these uh, features are already existing in Ironic. So in the future, we probably will leverage Ironic feature as much as possible as opposed to roll our own. But there are certain interesting features that, that I believe that most existing tools do not provide, something like OS configuration and check, and company pro provisioning task, and tenant-aware network traffic analysis, and load balancing technology. So this is my summary. Basically, I want to emphasize that uh, to, to build a hard solution, there are actually three technical challenges. One is how do you provide state isolation and performance isolation in a scalable and agentless way. That's one. The second is that how do you enable HAS uh, tenant to remotely use this PDCI? And third is how do you provide this HAS provider a glitchless uh, management of all the physical resources like server, storage, and switches? And each has is one such solution. So I'm slightly running out of time, so I'm going to give you a short demo on how to do this. Escape. So escape. And then go to this. So this is about three minutes. So what it does is just to give you a, a feel of how you can actually lease a PDCI. So the usual stuff, just enter some username and so on. And then you can select, uh, okay. you can select uh, the server that you want, like big server, small server. And then you can select, like, maybe you have multiple places, like in you know, north, the west side of the United States and you know, the east side of the United States. And then you can set up storage, like you can hard disk or uh, SSD and the, the actual size. And then you can set up the network with, then you can set up network how to connect these servers. Right, there are three choices, it's a new, net, new network, simple network, and existing network, and then just do it. So if you want to know more about this, you have to talk to me afterwards. And then you can add this leasing, just like you go to e-commerce site. And then once you have this order, then you can say, start, I want to uh, execute it. Confirm the order and start to provision. And then you can start doing provisioning. And so why is provisioning you would do all those things that we talk about, like maybe you want to get servers and you want to set up this BMC and BIOS, RAID car, NIC car, and so on. And this, this, this particular demo basically just shows that uh, this, we, we have two PDCI. One is called Jim's PDCI, the other is called Kaku's PDCI. And in this case, so if they, we want to show they are isolated. So you know, Jim ones cannot pin Kaku one. Jim one is the only node in the, Jim's uh, PDCI, and Kaku one is the other guy. And then later on, we can show that there's an action side. You can configure, once you get this uh, PDCI that you just subscribe, you can configure the BMC. So you can select a profile, that's like provisioning task, uh, and then you can comment on it, and then you can start running it. And while it's running, you will show status and so on. And then in the end, every provision operation will leave a log entry in the audit trail. And then you will use it to do retry, to cancel, and uh, uh, to, uh, to, to clear. Right. And finally, we can configure it, and it will indicate that it's complete. Right. And finally, we can return it once we are done. So, yeah. So in the interest of time, I'll stop here. And then I'll leave this, uh, pass the control to my colleague in KDDI. So what do I do? Just say. <coughs> oh, okay. So, okay. Cut us on. Okay. Oh, you already have it. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is I'm Masato Kato. I work in a platform technology development session of KDDI. Since joining KDDI, I have been in charge of developing infrastructure service. The current main task is change charge of the architect 
of infrastructure design supporting thousands of servers in KDDI cloud service. Uh, before starting main part, let me introduce KDDI profile. KDDI is second largest Japanese telecom company, uh, 35,000 employees, 43 billion US dollar operating revenue. KDDI runs global business from business segment point of view, KDDI operators fourth largest Deshi business in the world world under the name of Telehouse and also operates many submarine cable, unity and faster for Trans Pacific Ocean. Okay. In KDDI, EAS has been available since July 2012. We call KDDI platform, Cloud Platform Service, KCPS. EAS future a stable communication environment and full support, making full use of the characteristics of telecommunication company. Currently, we are providing operation rate at six, nine, three year in service where tens of thousands of VM are learning. It is very proud service for our engineer and the technology that support them also stay high level. It has a high customer satisfaction level. Therefore, users are increasing day by day. My mission is to stably, stable, provide construction, operation, improvement, and disposal of this years. From here, it will be the connector I would like to talk about today. So, how to make it possible to provide stable service. Okay. This page organizes the cycle infrastructure. It is a concept for consistently implementing operation from installation to disposal. We are systematizing these to ensure the simple use. We will provide this system utilizing ITRIs Bumpy and OpenStack. Network equipment and storage equipment can be managed in the same cycle. This blue is a construction operator. Orange is a user operation. Each status is divided into six status. Starting up by installation, the equipment, and turn on the power. Acquiring the environment of servers and the necessary nodes. Finally, the operation will start after the construction. Some time maintenance and disposal phase will be needed. Sorry. Okay. We call our HAS core engine HMS, HAS management suite. This is our HMS architecture. HMS is largely composed by three components. IPC, IPC component, Bumpy, and IIII. IPC for user interface, life cycle management, task control. It is also possible to control 
hardware device controlled to OpenStack or hardware directory. And Bumpy, which make it possible to control the BIOS layer of the server. Triple I is configuration management database server. Why did we make OpenStack the best component? Active code updated by community, abstract complex structure with API, orchestration by heat project, easy of integ integration of ITRI Bumpy in third party software. For the reason we chose OpenStack, this is why we are able to realize it quickly and be a liability. Uh, this also is, it is underdeveloped for next year's release. Please see the demo of the automation installation part of the server. This is log importer gamut and select the task. Server is select is uh, configuration. Choice is OS, a lot of OS. Bare metal support multi type of operation system, Windows and Red Hat a VMware. Select the install catalog, our BIOS BMC RAID configuration, a lot of type configuration selected. This is checking a job status. Finish the uh, release bare metal server. Okay. Completed. This is create catalog. Uh, user catalog is make. This is dashboard. It's a backup restore a bare metal server directory. Uh, task schedule management. Yes. Change the schedule and Server information view and communication tool. Chat and mail. Okay, okay thank you. Demo is finished. Okay. 
the efficient, efficiency of building time in constructing AT servers two weeks for preparation become two day, zero days. Oh, Ten people working become two people. It is possible to shorten the time required for three days to 15 minutes. Also, by automating various tasks, it is possible to construct a system that is uniform without setting mistake. Okay. We made automatic construction at Raspberry Pi as an integrating effort. Connecting the camera to Raspberry Pi without OS, we installed an operating system with HMS and automatically build a system that runs container and streaming delivery. I think that can be a applied to maintenance and management of small device, such as IoT device, in the future. By applying HMS and linking with OpenStack, we can centrally manage a wide variety of devices. It is our goal to fully control all hardware devices with the API. Thank you. I will return to the Dr. Che. Okay. So that's it. There's two parts of this talk. Are there any questions about either part of the talk? At this point, yes. Yes, we have to require sort of a cooperation from the servers. Uh, there are certain you know, minute details that we need their cooperation, and there are some BMC support and so on. Yes. Yes. He's or mine? Okay. Can you say it again, the question? Instructor? We can change the... Oh, location not change. Okay. What? That slide is about Raspberry, right? Second to last. Let's see. Oh, demo? demo. No slide. <laughs> you say you can change the what? The location or instruction set or what? Can you change the location of the ser servers? Uh, out of location and managed. Huh? Can you move machine around right now? Uh, no, no, don't move. I mean right now, no. Yeah. What information? Oh, uh, it's a database, right? Yeah. Okay, lock number and uh, server serial number and server device maker are out of information. So the, oh, yes. the location information of a server should consist of like which rack and which slot of which yes. rack, right? yes. that kind of thing. Yeah. Yes? Okay. Yes. Architecture, yeah. So, how do you see the event? Uh, 
FEMP, yes. So, so I think your question is well taken, right? So the answer is very obvious, it's standardization, yeah. right? So it, by eventually, just like ironically, more and more driver. So we probably have a driver for Dell machine model, blah, 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 yeah. you know, driver for HP, blah, 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 or Intel, ISD, or whatever, right? So in the end, that's what's going to happen. So we are going to standardize that interface. So ironically, it's going to do that, I believe, that eventually that there will be an interface. And then under the interface, every vendor will provide some driver. And then there will become some way to control each individual driver in terms of setting up the BIOS, BMC, how to boot, and all these things. And then probably eventually we'll extend it to not just a server, but also the PCIe interface car, like NIC car or RAID car. All those things will become some sort of driver if this idea actually takes off. Yes. Yes. Uh, kind of tend to depend on uh, uh, the need and uh, depends on how much you think other parties are. Yes. So, uh, every blockchain that came will have this, uh, you know, uh, in principle agreement that it is the way to go. So, uh, how do you see uh, other? So, so right now, I, I have to be honest. We don't have them many experiences with different kinds of server vendors. We only have experience with a very small number of servers, uh, vendors that are willing to cooperate with us, and really. That you are in mm. other yes, we are, that yes. Can... And then, you know, if you think about it, most of these server vendors are from Taiwan anyway. So actually has a very good uh, position to try to do something along this line. Mm. So if we want to actually standardize this thing, but the big deal is really whether there's a, there's a big pool from the user community like KDDI. If KDDI say this is what I want, then the server vendors will listen, and then they probably will do something to you know accommodate uh, such a standardization process. Yes, that, that's my take. Yeah. All right. So if there's nothing more, then thank you very much for so sticking out thank to the last. Thank you.